Um, I want to invite a friend of mine up here. I was going to call you a guest speaker, but you're more than that. Come on up here, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler Vitito is family. He came through Lynn Haven Church. He was, um, I'll, go in, I'll go in through his resume here in just a second. I've already been told that I was mini-me this morning. <laughs> I didn't think it was that funny. But Tyler is a longtime yeah. friend. I Y'all know he's sensitive. Y'all got to I am. <laughs> I am. Tyler came up through the ministry here. He served with Neil as the assistant youth uh, pastor. When I was on staff here, um, he, was, he, was, he was just here for a little bit, and then he went and did on uh, some other cool things. He served over at Christ Church in Mobile. He served at St. James over that way, and then most recently at Orange Beach. But the reason he's here today is because he is now the director of the Asbury Foundation, the Asbury Seminary Scholarship Foundation. So Tyler gets to travel around to different churches and, and help raise support for that. This is a great fund. Um, we're going to get to the tithes and offerings in a second. But part of what you do um, contributes to this fund. We're big supporters of it. I just want to let you know, um, th- I was right, Matt, trying to make a list this morning of all the pastors that we've had that have, that have attended Asbury or our alumni. And uh, I'm going to forget somebody, but off the top of my head, we had Doug Pennington, Craig Carter, Kathy Bird. Mindy Clemens, Tyler Vitito, and then I've even bounced around Asbury myself a little bit. Um, so it is a wonderful thing, the theology that you're taught here, the biblically-based evangelical theology, that Wesleyan theology is taught at Asbury Seminary, and that's why we do what we do, to bring scriptural holiness throughout the land. Um, Tyler and his family will be out in the lobby. Um, he's been married for 14 years. If you knew him growing up, I can't believe he's that old, so that makes me a little bit older than that. Um, yeah, 22. <laughs> but Tyler, we're so thankful that you're here, buddy, and we're glad um, that your family's with us also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to ask God to bless the offering and to bless Tyler as well. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for the faith we have in Jesus Christ and that we are a part of your chosen generation. Enable us in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of of the Lord Jesus to be a good and faithful witness in your earthly walk. May you be glorified and exalted in our lives. May we sing your eternal praises and all we say and do from this day forward and forevermore. Lord, bless Tyler as he brings us your word. Bless the offering. May many people come to know you and love Jesus Christ through the generosity shown here this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. Feels good to be home. Y'all ever gone home and it just felt right? That's what I'm feeling right now. And I, people know me, apparently. I'm hoping for it's all good things, all good things. Uh, so glad to be here today. Thank you guys for being an awesome church. Thank you for that worship service. And man, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share today. And I, wa- I want to just let you know, this sermon was 10 years in the making. That's the last time I was here, 10 years ago. Uh, I was just reflecting with some parents, youth, people that were in our youth ministry and I was on staff with. It was 10 years ago, I, I left home church and went to do some more work in Mobile, and I've just been missing home, man. It's just hard, it's hard to move home. It's not just a nostalgia trip coming back, because everyone has the hometown, right? But when you go back someplace where you know you belong, where you know you feel loved and love others, that's where, and most importantly, where you feel the presence of the Lord, that you come back and you're like, well, God's still here. God's still here. That's awesome. So anyway, I'm so glad to be here this morning. I want to just share a, a quick word with you. Um, Something that really, really has been on my heart for a long time. Something that God's been speaking to me about continually. And I think something that he's got special for you this morning. If you want to get ahead real quick, just go ahead and flip to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be in ver- at verse 9 if you have your Bible with you. But um, man, I was thinking about what happened, how I got here, how I got to this church, how I was a part of this church and all the things that I've been able to do since then. And I remember Ryan Rogers invited me to youth group one day. I was like, what's a youth group? <laughs> it's like, what is, what is this? What, what am I supposed to do there? Do I talk? Do I go meet people? Will there be food? You know, I remember, will there be food? And where? There, yeah. And so there was. Ryan Rogers brought me to youth group, and that's the night I met Neil McGee. And does everyone remember the day they met Neil McGee? I think so. I think everyone remembers those days. You can't, you can't miss him. And he was a person that really became important to me, not just me, but my brother, my family, and other people in the church, in the community. Neil's still doing youth ministry, which, which is so cool. And I think it's really 
amazing to see the legacy left behind by the church and the other people on staff, Doug Pennington, and not just the staff, but the people that are doing ministry in the church. The staff people help other people do ministry, and I just want to say thank you for being a wonderful church, but I remember Ryan inviting me and just feeling loved that first day, feeling welcomed that first day. And ever since then, I've always been on the lookout for new people. Like whenever there's a new person, you never know what God's going to do when that new person walks in. And I just want to encourage you guys, I know you still are, but keep doing it. Keep being the church that says, you're welcome here, your family here, God loves you, Christ died for you, the Holy Spirit wants to fill you, you're going to be amazing, you're welcome to be here. And so keep being that church, keep being that church, because it's so incredible what God does when we, when we have that hospitality that the Holy Spirit gives us to have. So thank you guys so much for, anyway, enough of that, enough of that, all the sentimental stuff. Um, but what I wanted to say, you guys, is that I have a word for you today, and it's about the calling of God. It's about the calling of God. And I think it's something that we're really going to be able to dive into and learn something new about. You know, I, feel, I felt called to ministry right here at Lynn Haven Methodist Church. I say called to ministry. I'm like, what does that mean? I, I use the word all the time. You guys ever know those Christian words that you just have to have a dictionary to figure out what, they're, what they mean? Speaking of new people, sorry if you hear all these, these ideas and words that you're like, what is that? What's an offering? You know, what's all this stuff? But calling is one of those phrases we use. I've said it like 10 times already since I've been up here. And sometimes you have to understand, you have to have it explained to you or see in the Bible, where does this idea come from? It's one of those like really special concepts that only exists in spiritual things. Calling is one of those things we use in a non-spiritual way to get in contact with somebody or we give someone a name like, what are we going to call our new child? We're going to call them this. Reminds me of when the shepherd, I'm sorry, the angel told Mary, you'll call him Jesus. The word calling is all through the Bible. And when we think about it in a spiritual context, that's what I think we're going to be reading today. I want to, I'm so excited to share that with you. What I want to ask you guys to do is to think about the time that you felt God's calling on your life. The time that you felt God speaking to you and letting you know that you're loved, that your life matters, that you're important to him and important to other people. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, because that helps us narrow our focus into what a spiritual idea of calling truly means. In 1 Peter, listen, he's talking to Christians all over the Roman area, okay? So Christians were scattered, gathering in groups. Just a tiny bit of context here. This was a circulated letter. So this letter was being passed around from church to church. And Peter is addressing the church, and he says this to them, in, chapter, in verse 9, he says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into light. What I love about this verse, not in a judgmental way, but Peter is contrasting the Christians who are reading this letter. He contrasts them right before this verse. He's contrasting them with the people who denied Jesus. The people who persecuted Jesus and who are currently persecuting them, the Christians in that day. And he says, look how different you are. What he's summarizing for them is those who rejected Christ, that used to be what you were like. Look how far you've come. And what he says to them is you are a chosen people. You are set apart, you are called out of that darkness, rejecting Jesus, not following God, not loving God, into the light of Christ, into the light of living for the Lord, okay? So what he's saying to Christians, he's contrasting those two things. But let me tell you this real quick, because the important thing about this is that Peter is using very intentional language here that's similar, you might have caught it, it's very similar to the way the Old Testament talks about the people of Israel, as God's chosen people, Peter's saying, similarly, you, people who follow Jesus, are the chosen people of God. Now listen, that whole chosen idea, like we're all special, that really clashes with something I think is also true, is that we can't put ourselves on a pedestal, because that's not what Christ did. Christ lowered himself. He washed the feet of sinners. The king of the universe came in a manger. You know, 
for me, if, you, if, you, if you've ever read The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, I think it's mandatory. Like we all, if you haven't, please do. Do you remember the first sentence in the book? Anybody? This is not, I don't want to call anybody out. Does anybody remember it? It's not about you. It's not about you. That's what Rick, I'm like, thanks, Rick. You know, but it's so true. It's not about us. But then we read stuff like this, where Peter is talking about that we're chosen, we're set apart. We are a holy nation. And what he means by holy nation there, guys, listen, he's not talking about a particular church. He's not talking about a particular denomination. He's not talking about a particular group. What he's saying is, you who follow the way, which the way then meant the way of Jesus. Those who follow Jesus, you are a chosen nation. Now, we don't have the same skin color. We don't come from the same country. What he's saying is you are a group of people with shared values and a shared mission and a shared leader. You don't have laws. You don't have a government. It's only, it's only him. What he's saying is, and the Christians of that day had differences just like we have today. We cannot, we cannot forget we have different styles. We have different doctrines. We have different beliefs. We have different histories. But those who follow Jesus, any and all people who follow Jesus, are chosen. And we need to act like it. We need to act like it together. We need to act like we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the things that separate us are so small compared to what Jesus has done to bring us together. Amen? We have to remember we together are the light of Christ in the world. So listen, it's not all about us. But Jesus wants us to know the price that was paid for us. And that salvation, that is for us. Peter's saying here, you are the light. You have been bought at a price. And what he's telling them is you have been brought out of the darkness into the light. You're a chosen people. And what he says is you have been called. You have been called out of darkness. Okay? So listen, he doesn't put any qualifiers on that. He doesn't say you've been called out of darkness if you're, at the, if you're a teenager or if you're at least 10 years old, if you're at least five years old, or if you attend a church or if you give your tithes and offerings or if you live a holy life or anything. There's no qualifiers on the calling except that you follow Christ. And so what's amazing here is that he's telling them you are a chosen people set apart because of what Jesus has done for you. So what is the calling, okay? What is the call of God? Because it's different than what, I don't know why I got this concept of the call of God, that it's about what you do. And it's about your skills. And it's about where you go to school. And it's about your profession. It's about your, your occupation. It's about your vocation. It's about your job description. It's about what you do professionally. Is this what God's called me to do? Is he called me to be a lawyer? Is he called me to be a pastor? Is he called me to be a, a, a children's minister? Is he called me to be an elementary school teacher? I don't know. God, tell me what your calling is for me. That's the concept that I thought of. But what's amazing here is that the concept of calling by God has so little to do with our job and so much to do with what Jesus has done for us. Listen to this really quick. I think it's important for us to understand that the call of God is about an invitation from God to live a life of purpose, live a life of purpose. It's that divine invitation from God in Christ to do something meaningful for God in our lives. You know, I think about the youth ministry days back in 2000s. I was reconnecting with some students that I had in youth ministry and I was thinking about the, what it was like back then. You know, this place was different, but a lot of things were different. I remember Blockbuster Video. I remember CD players. I remember, that was before flip phones. I was going to say flip phones. That didn't happen, happen then either. I remember when text messages, those were just emails, right? I remember the differences of when I was young. I remember before streaming. I remember before a lot of things, right? But what I, what I can tell you hasn't changed, what I think has happened all the way through human history and what will continue to happen after us is that people are desperate for purpose. People are always trying to find out who am I? Why am I here? What am I called to do? What am I going to do with my life? And we tie, I think it's just a Western thing. We tie that into our profession so often. It's about what we do. I and mean, we spend a lot of time at work, right? We want our work to matter. 
We want our work to be something fulfilling, something meaningful, something that is great. And if it's not the, if it's not the best thing in the world, at least like make, let me make good money so I can do something with it. You know, like we think about work when we think about calling. But I think what Peter's telling us here, the call of God is the invitation to follow Jesus. That's the call of God that he's asked us to consider. So when we say this, what's the purpose of my life? When we're searching for purpose, the answer is not about what we do from nine to five. I have a friend in Orange Beach, his name's Ken. And Ken's one of these great Southern gentlemen that have a few slang phrases, these one-liners that they use multiple times a day. You know what I mean? You know those people? His line was, we were talking about this, his line that he said all the time was, my purpose in life is to live fat, dumb, and happy and die. <laughs> but then I met Jesus. That's what he said. <laughs> then I met, and I've heard him say that probably 10 times, right? I've, I'm like, every time I'm like hearing it for the first time, yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> like, that's, that, but that phrase sticks with me because it reminds me the way we used to live and the way we live since we've met Jesus. Because following Christ, having the purpose and understanding that we were worth dying for makes a difference in the way we live. It gives us hope and meaning and purpose and a fulfillment that you can't find in the world. Okay? Without God, Rick Warren says this in his book, The Purpose Driven Life. He says, without God, life has no purpose. Without God, without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance. Friends, if you don't know this yet, I want you to know it today. Your life matters. Amen. Don't let the world beat you up and make you think you're not important. You're not everything. You know, the world doesn't revolve around you, like mom said, right? But don't forget who gave his life for you. Your life matters. You have a life of significance, of purpose. Christ died for you. The Spirit fills you, and God's called you. Okay? It's so easy to think about calling, and when we're thinking about calling what God calls us to do or who we're called to be, we're thinking about other people. We think about a pastor or like a great preacher or a great worship leader or there's a missionary person. And those are the people who are called because they're doing the Lord's work, right? My friend, my friend in Mobile I used to have, he used to call them professional Christians. Those are the professional Christians that everybody else is just doing something. No. Like when you look at a missionary and we say they're called to, I don't know, Honduras. And then in the back of your mind, you're like, what am I called to but what about, this, what about the elementary school teacher? What about the military service member? What about the business owner? What about the technicians? Are they called? Yes. The answer is a huge yes. Every time. Because what we're asking is, what about the person of that possession? What about the person of that? What about the elementary school? Wait, hold on, hold on a second. Her name's Abby. What about the car salesman? What about the, what about the military? Wait, 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 wait. His name's Tim. And Jesus died for him. What about, what about that politician? What about that person? Like, is that person called to do that? Wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to say a politician's name right now. But... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can have all the feelings you want. Christ died for them. So when we frame people inside their profession box, that's wrong. It's wrong for me to frame myself that way. It's wrong for you to frame yourself this way. Because a friend reminded me right after the last service, God has not called you to a profession. He's not called you to a place. He's not called you to an occupation. He's not called you to anything. He's called you to a person. And the person is Jesus. What's your calling? It's Jesus. Yes. 